lecture of the Flipped Field Conference. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. How do they answer that? Well, you know what? The hats went always a weird question to me. Like, when they yell, no, what does that mean? It means I'm going to scream. Sorry. Or we'll go and find a mic, something like that. Okay, so tonight it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jeff Kipnis, a professor at the Ohio State University and our current Green World Visiting Professor at UIC. Jeff is someone who almost needs no introduction. He's one of the preeminent thinkers in our field, whose writings have consistently argued for the advancement of disciplinary specificity in architecture, whose public presence immediately exudes a culture of discipline disciplinary accountability for all of us around him, and whose architectural criticism <coughs> manages to transcend the often policed confines of academic scholarship with a healthy dose of popular culture. Electric guitar make up the stones, without ever compromising content, an argument, or a position. Uh, when I first asked Jeff to deliver a keynote at this ACSA conference almost a year ago, which I said was in part about recuperating the role of cultural ideas for the discipline, Jeff said two things to me. One, it'll take me a year to come to terms with attending an ACSA conference. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I'm against ideas. So while the first was in many ways out of my control, he obviously came around. The second is something I'd like to dwell on a little as an introduction to Jeffness by recalling what the Venturis claimed of modern architects in their relationship to symbolism in learning from Las Vegas, namely that they claim that the modern architects denied in theory what they were doing in practice. So despite Jeff's claim to be against ideas, there is no other architectural critic I know who has come up with as many crackpot ideas, refreshing in their preposterousness, for the institutions, the figures, the theories, the relationships between people, the hiring and firing of deans, even the legacies in our academic and professional practices than Jeff. In the role of a mentor, Jeff is incredibly generous with advice to the upcoming generation of designers, critics, and theorists many of whom have benefited from this generosity who are presenting at the conference over the next, over today and tomorrow. In terms of his advice to me, there were two. You may not remember these. Don't apply for a tenure track job. And you've got everything going for you except your mentor. He meant Bob Sommel when he said that. <laughs> While he's in He's an advocate uh, for several designers of a certain persuasion. He is a force to be reckoned with if you're a theorist or critic. His responses to your work can make you burst out laughing or burst into tears. No doubt I'll be laughing through the tears after this introduction. But above all, Jeff's loyalty to the discipline and its advancement is the reason we invited him here today. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jeff Kipnis. responsible for my career in a way that I had never quite, it never had occurred to me how important it was to me until today when I was trying to figure out why it was such a problem. This entire lecture has been about trying to not attack people, you know, and not attack anybody that's in the ACSA, and, and I, it was just weird, and uh, so I'll explain it to you a bit. Uh, just so you understand, I am actually getting paid in asterisks, which is a kind of, it's not like a password. <laughs> uh, which is an incredible 
incredible thing. Have you ever tried to spend an asterisk? It's really interesting. Um, I can no longer think clearly, uh, so I'm not sure what the lecture is about, but I'll tell you something it might be about. Uh, it might be about this project. This is a new project by Stan Allen. It was for the Maribor competition. You saw Emil's version last night. And I wanted to discuss this a little bit and why I think it's so good and this is so bad. Uh, I really think this is a this David Chipperfield's River Museum project. I really dislike it a lot. Uh, I started to pay attention to these genre. I collect genres of projects, like single surface projects, box and box projects, all sorts of things. Uh, because I am extremely interested in the idea of disciplinarity, and that will have to do with the other idea that I think is important. So disciplinarity is idea one, or idea two. And idea one is misbehavior. Uh, I am a, a thorough advocate for misbehavior having made my career entirely on that basis and not being able to stop misbehaving, but also occupying a role in a discipline that has a kind of preposterous self-image of itself as behaving correctly. And so, I, which I don't know, preposterous in a funny sense. Um, so that's the second idea. And so, I, and I'll tell you all about that somehow when I can think clearly better in the future. Uh, so that's one thing that might happen and I'm not quite sure. It, this is. I'm starting to really get interested in buildings that are being put up on top of other buildings or, or voids underneath. So it kind of started with this project, the Kaiser Forum, which is a building on top of an old building. But then if you, one of the great things that Herzog and Brun did was also lift the old building. So they excavated out the base of it. So even it is on top of something else. So, um, I don't know, I have, a, I have 150 single surface projects. I have this gigantic collection of these things. Let's see, so that might happen. Um, the other thing I really wanted to talk to you about tonight is how much I resent the envy of science in my discipline. I just, I super resent it. I study science. I love science. <coughs> Most of the magazines I take are still science magazines. Uh, the envy of science has got nothing to do with the practice of science. It's got nothing to do with the benefits of science delivers to uh, architecture. I think of architecture as a cultural practice. And I don't think of culture, I don't think there's such a thing as the science of culture or the science of humanities. And so part of the misbehavior idea is to try to figure out um, how to address this. And it's particularly acute today for reasons that I thought became really interesting in the, in the papers I heard today. I heard the catastrophe session, and I also heard the uh, thing in the morning. What was that called? Audience. Oh, yeah, you guys. Um, you know, and so we feel an increasing pressure to justify our benefit to the world. Uh, we make huge demands on scarce resources. We also know that those demands we make have uh, deleterious effects very often. And so, you know, we, we're, in the, we're caught up in this problem of doing good. Uh, and it seems like if we pay attention to science, we can do good. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you can't do good by doing science, but you can do good by just doing disciplinary work, which we're going to discuss about. This is a slide. Um, but I guess I'll tell you the ACSA story. Uh, I promise to be short because I'm so disorganized. I guarantee you this will be short. At some point, I'll just say, "Well, that's enough." <laughs> then we'll be done. Um, I'll back up. Um, Twenty years ago, in 1989, so 21 years ago, I attended my <coughs> last ACS conference. Uh, my first one was the year before. It was here. Stanley Tigerman put it together. Um, I then we then went to me and my friends in the field went to the Miami National ACS Conference with the intention of hijacking. And those friends were me, Mark Wrigley, Beatrice Colomina, Catherine Ingram, Bob McAnulty, uh, that group of people. And uh, we went there, and we really behaved badly. It, we behaved so badly that I was on stage, and uh, there were three of us. On, it was me, Bob, Rob, Bob Lizzie, who you wouldn't know, you probably don't know, and uh, the, the dean at Harvard, I remember the guy's name, uh, Clyde City, co author. Fred Coder. Yeah, and so I was sitting here, and, uh, and Michael Hayes was sitting at the report, and Bob Lizzie was here. Fred was kind of over here like this. And this, at the time, there were two issues that everybody was concerned with, and that was contextualism and uh, gender rights. And all the papers were about those issues. And uh, what I decided to do, actually, to follow the problem of contextualism since that time to see 
with who did the best job at solving some of these problems. But anyway, uh, a lady, a woman stands up and says, you know, I don't, I resent the idea that the four of you guys can even speak to the problem of gender issues, which some of us are trying to do. And I said, I stood up and sort of half jokingly said, you know, I don't know what you see on the stage, but I see three men and a woman trying to speak to a certain 40th sense of myself. And, and everybody got really mad. Of course, this was an outrageous ACS thing. Everybody was furious. Mark Wigley got in a screaming match with uh, all of UVA, like the entire. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend came over to me and uh, said afterwards, he said, uh, you yeah, know, I really appreciated what you did tonight, but I really did not like it when you called me a <laughs> So we decided that there, there and then that we were not going to do ACSA things anymore. We were going to get together, we were going to form a kind of group, and we were going to, like, if one of us got a job, we'd give the other one's lecture. We basically decided that we would piggyback our, ourselves up our careers and support each other because at that point in time we had mutual interests. And so there was another guy named there, and his name was John White, and he was uh, the head of something called the uh, SOM Foundation, which occurred at the it's not the, the Carnal House. Oh. Charnel <laughs> House. What is it called? Charnley House. Charnley House. There you go. Thank you. Now, it turned out, speaking of misbehavior, that uh, Bruce, what was the guy that had SOM Bruce up there? Grant. Sorry. I can't think anymore. It's a group he, he started the SOM Foundation, and he started this thing that we were, that we were about to participate in uh, uh, in order to steal money from SOM. Yeah. But he was channeling money through this thing. That this, I was told this by Walter Dead right before he died, so maybe there was an agenda. But anyway, immediately, all of us got $35,000 grants so, you know, by acting up the ACSA and withdrawing. And we got $35,000 grants. I went home, immediately bought a house, didn't spend this one dime on it to do research or anything. And, you know, that's why we're here today. So <laughs> thank you, SA, ACSA. So misbehave at ACSA, and you will get thirty-five thousand. <laughs> Slapstick. This is uh, right after uh, World War II, and in the, during the occupation of Japan, there was an effort on the part of the Japanese and the Americans to collaborate in examining the damage. Form a joint mathematical commission to do surveys and do statistical analysis of the effects of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I mean, it's not funny, and I don't mean this to be a joke, but it is an extremely interesting moment in the chain. And this is what the American mathematicians produced, and it's it's based on a mathematical idea uh, called an orthonormal basis set, which means if you're part of any part of that group, you're not double counted. So it broke the population into uh, ages. Uh, distance from the uh, bomb, if I remember correctly, and then their co-graphs with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It's extremely interesting to understand, seemed extremely rational analysis of the effect of the bomb. The Japanese, when they saw this, they thought it was so childishly trivial. It's not that they didn't understand it, that they just thought that they, we had no concept of either mathematics or what it meant, meant to understand a culture. And so here was what they produced. Now, this is a multivariate analysis of the effect on personal relationships. So these are like, if you'll see, you'll see heads of households that were kid, killed, eldest sons, second and younger sons, eldest daughters, other relatives, sisters, and nieces. It's a very complex social analysis, which they thought was the only way to understand scientifically their work. This required a level of math, math, uh, multivariate analysis on the part of Japanese mathematicians that was uh, over the heads of the American mathematician group. So a whole other group had to come in. And so for me, it's a really good picture of right when you expect a, a, an important sense of sobriety, and therefore you're going to jettison you know, cultural vagaries and become as scientific as you possibly can. You do a really bad job by, because the kinds of things we deal with, there are people's lives and their relationship to it. It's very difficult to uh, quantify that and turn that into science. And one of the most interesting things about architecture is the minute someone in architecture discovers a truth about building, which is scientific, it leaves our discipline. You know, it becomes code, it becomes uh, an engineering practice. I mean, 
who among you can name the first architect to use electrification in, an in a building and why? Who among you knows about indoor plumbing? Who among you knows about the insulation? Um, the minute we actually succeed at that level to make a prototypical advance in the world of building that's absolutely invaluable, it leaves our discipline, doesn't no longer part of our studies, it becomes part of the way buildings get standardized, and that's a good thing. Here's another example, probably a little bit more lighthearted, uh, and also having to do with green ideas. Uh, if you go to Princeton, you will see these in every bag. These are the instructions on how to flush a toilet. <laughs> now, if you look closely, it's trying to, you know, it's trying to make it clear. So, for number one, <laughs> liquid waste. <laughs> you do that. And for number two, now I'm thinking to myself, wow, that is so weird. Why didn't they just put, you know, for liquid waste, you know, why number one and why number two? I just felt, I feel like so infantilized. <laughs> I don't have those here, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, but th another thing I might do, I have a, how many of you have ever heard me lecture before? Okay, I, that's what I was really worried about. <laughs> I, I knew everything you see tonight you've seen before, including this, my favorite thing. Not only have you seen this before, but I've now been lecturing and people, if I try to do something new, they say, oh, that was fine, but can you do some of the old stuff? You know, like, like, can you play stuff from the first album? <laughs> this is from the first album. This, I believe, is the greatest piece of social thinking I've ever studied read by any philosopher or any uh, uh, theorist. And I'll, I want you to hear it out loud because I want to pay his attention to it. I know you know it by heart. You can all <laughs> The most important guy here, the guy that's misbehaving, is the last guy. Look, you've got it all wrong. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anybody. You've got to think to yourself. You're all individual. Yes, we're all Misbehaving, and this, the problem of misbehaving is interesting to me. It's why you have to return to the question of disciplinarity. At the time of that ACSA conference 20 years ago, the field had become so utterly stultified that the the relationship between discipline and profession had become so tight, and the field had become so utterly stultified under the burden of that uh, collaboration that there was really nowhere to move. And so, a, a gigantic canning-breaking um, impetus hit our field just like it hit every other field at the time. And you know, so interdisciplinarity, importing art, philosophy, anything but paying attention to the discipline because the discipline and the profession had become so equated. Um, that produced, I think, incredible results over the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, however, it, has, it leads us to a point where <laughs> there's a slippage between um, amateurism which we all became. We all became amateur philosophers, amateur, amateur everything, uh, and ineptitude. And I, ineptitude is not not knowing, you know, not, I don't mean it as pejoratively as it sounds. It's essentially having so little knowledge about the possibilities and powers of what you can do, you, you're no longer in control of, you can no longer dispose your effects. So, for example, uh, the effect of walking up a staircase into a museum and having it transport you from the uh, profane and the quotidian into the uh, sacred. Uh, whether we use that or not, or whether we want to use that, it's a really powerful tool that you can only study, you can only know and command by having a strong sense of your discipline. So the point, we've gotten to the point now where I think there's so little, uh, it's, not, it's not historical term, there's so little regard for the powers that we had accumulated that were disciplinary powers, that you look at a lot of projects that are essentially trying to produce effects that they envy in science and not having any idea how powerful effects that they might be able to produce just by studying their own field. Like, let's say you don't want the salutary effects of a therapy. You don't want 
to guarantee the value of a work of art by building a ceremonial staircase, uh, like the, um, uh, let's say, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And you would you prefer to have people walk immediately off the grade and with no ceremonial entry. So to disestablish that authorizing version, that authorization of the art, that's a, just a tool you have to know in the discipline. You have to learn the magic tricks of the discipline and technique, and then you can decide whether to use them or not, and then, uh, then you can also decide what other ideas you want to import and uh, how you can relate to other fields. Now, in order to discuss this question of the relationship to other fields, it means we have to take up the problem of autonomy. Uh, autonomy produced the sort of stultifications that we were talking about. The first, uh, the ge first generation of modern autonomy uh, produced those kinds of you know, professionalisms in the field that had to do with uh, how to match the context, how to handle the program, how to build, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, Clement Greenberg was an interesting figure, and he was the first and most important theorist of autonomy in art, and it's useful sometimes to go back and look at his argument. He basically argued that uh, each discipline, each practice, could be defined by its characteristic practices, what it did, you know, painters painted, the painters painted on canvas, um, and there was, he urged all these disciplines to achieve medium specificity, I know you've heard these terms, through an act of purification. So his idea of autonomy meant find out what you are in your essence and then jettison all the contaminations in your field that didn't belong. So uh, he considered, for example, representation to be a legacy of uh, historical legacy and no longer no longer part of the discipline of painting. And so he had an urge to abstraction. But what was important was his definition of autonomy required strong boundaries. You had to get stuff out that didn't belong in and not let stuff in. Uh, if you didn't, then you became open to the vagaries of all sorts of misguided contaminations and. Uh, unsavory lures. Um, since that time, we have, um, through a philosophy that was characterized last night by Neil as, uh, you know, as Sanford Quinter's uh, introduction into the field, and it was called at the time the change of paradigm from a Newtonian to a biological paradigm. So, and basically, I, it's not a really great way to think about it, but uh, it really means this, is one of the things that biologists notice, and actually all uh, sciences of matter uh, notice, is that whenever matter organizes, whether it's alive or not, it organizes into species. So it organizes into stars or galaxies. There's not one instance over the 63 orders of magnitude that constitute the known universe. And that's exactly the number of possible uh, dimensions that you can know from smallest possible dimensions, over 63 orders of magnitude, there's not one instance of matter, either animate or inanimate, organizing into something other than a species. Now, the species have an interesting characteristic. They're not categories. They're not types. They have very strong centers and very weak boundaries. And they have very weak boundaries because they, they maintain their status as disciplines and their autonomy as species precisely through a set of economic exchanges with other disciplines. So they basically have to eat them or get eaten. Uh, and when you eat another species, you don't become that species or you don't represent that species, you might be able to re-originate it. Cat poisonous caterpillars get poisonous oftentimes by eating poisonous plants. They don't produce their own poison. But in any case, it's not about representing the plant, it's about incorporating the intelligence and knowledge of another discipline into the terms of the, the species. And so I think that gives us a really interesting way to return to our field and study the problem of disciplinarity without, without the fears that we had of selfification, of the hardened boundary, and certainly without a notion of purification. And that's actually uh, the contribution I'm going to make. Here's an interesting effect. I, I just discovered this this morning. This is a flat slide. Right. This is a flat slide. But if, if you do that, because of the motion, it produces momentarily a kind of perspectival model, if you see it. 
So I don't know what that is, but I just discovered that. <laughs> so now we're going to trace uh, the difference between what I think of as a professional architectural uh, trajectory. And particularly, I want to look at the problem of contextuality, because that was the problem that was so enraging 20 years ago, contextualism. Uh, and I, I invite you to look at this plan, and I know you know these plans. So. This is the National Gallery uh, in Trafalgar Square, and that's the Venturi edition. And those are the dates of the edition. So the original museum was the blue, and then it grows into a neoclassical plan for the model and uh, semper. And then the, the last edition is the orange one at the upper left-hand corner. Um, and it's done almost the same time as Bob Venturi's. Uh, I'm not sure, was he working with Denise at the time? Yeah, I think it is. Venturi, Scott Brown. Probably uh, Einstein, whatever they guys What's his name? Eisen what? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. I knew it was like a famous guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible thing for a president to do. I get it? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you look at the, that plan, it's very easy to understand. It's, it's bona fides in terms of its professional ambitions. It essentially is a mimic of the entire museum recapitulated into a kind of simple modern and abstracted. Forgetting the entire history of the place. It's got nothing, no, so it, its organization is just a, a kind of recapitulation of the, the whole museum in, in miniature. Uh, Venturi and Scott Brown's plan is something utterly different. Um, and it has, I, I'm always interested, where's my pointer? What, does anybody know what the most radical feature, but besides the fact that it uses uh, not on a lot of planning, or the same kind of planning that's uh, the same kind of movement through the galleries. It, it's a laser, which I just broke. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to movies. Have you noticed the laser dot inflation in crime dramas? <laughs> like when they first started, this meant you were going to get shoot, shot. Right? Remember that? Now you got to have forty. <laughs> so there's some there's some extra like team of extra. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty, the most incredible here. Let me show you the grand entry, grand entry, grand entry, grand entry. Come over, turn left, turn left, turn left. Flip through, and what a wonderful entry into a museum. It's dead end to the wall. That is, now, to my eyes, that is the most interesting piece of disciplinary misbehavior. I mean, you, instead of walking in, there's no ceremonial entry, there's no central core, there's no um, spatial guarantee of where you are and what you're supposed to do. You just, boom, dead end. Now, why would you do that? Why would you copy the plans? By the way, this is a copy of White Law's uh, department stores. This is how they display their goods at White Law's. White Law's was an old... Um, masonry, you know, when the bricks hold up the walls. One of those things. Yeah, load bearing. Uh, it wasn't a crank show, yeah, so it was built, it's a load bearing, and they had to build those kind of things. And this is how they display their goods. And then you dead into this wall, and like that is a fantastic idea. But since I'm interested in your disciplinarianisms, I'm going to give you a test. Like, why would you do that? Exactly. That's what I thought. <laughs> Is it? I can actually put somebody on the spot. Let's see. Heather. <laughs> I knew see. I was going to be on the spot. I have an answer. <laughs> you know? uh, it's to uh, wrap circulation around and keep it moving. Ah, that's an interesting idea. That's, that's a kind of scientific idea. <laughs> I like that. I think it's basically this. Bob and Denise were populists. And they were, they, their entire literature is about the importance of populist interests and populist values. And they were, they had this sort of anti elitism And they are now building in the most elite institution, on the most elite site in the entire world of elitism. Uh, I guarantee it. And so their job is to figure out how, to some sense, democratize the collection and the experience and the ambitions. Somehow, 
that you're going through this museum and you know there's some relaxation of that. And I think the use of the department store model, which is a way of displaying goods for consumption, but without guaranteeing them, and also the dead end entry is a precisely an effort to do that. And the, the great thing about it is that you can tra trace the dead end to this plant. This is the entry to the mother's house. And you know, you know the mother's, I'm not showing you the facades, because I expect you to know these things. You come in and you know, you're expecting to walk in, get to the room where the heart is, and bang, you get the wall. Yeah. Now, why would you do that? That's just a weird thing to do. But it has to do with studying, not just meeting customs and habits, it has to do with thinking about the psychology, the expectations, and it, you know, it changes the building quite a bit. Now, I'm not going to do the analysis of that for you, but, you know, that project predated the other project for 80 years, and there's probably about 80 years. <laughs> 30 years. Yeah, 30 years, and there's you know, probably half a dozen dead ends in the experiment. So I'll leave it to you to think about that, but for me, that's an example of the difference between a professional achievement and a disciplinary achievement. Now, I don't dismirk professional achievement. I guarantee you, I like them. You know, I like to be able to get into my house. My, there's no architecture in my house. Well, art, no architecture. It's, it's cheap, comfortable, convenient, um, and you know, it's, it's okay, a wonderful place to live, but uh, it doesn't really have any architecture to it. Uh, now, so I'm just going to so this is the campus of Cincinnati. I'm just going to point out to you that this has become this camp. This project started. The campus of Cincinnati decided to hire a master planner, George, George uh, Hargraves. Everybody knows George. I don't need the last name. <laughs> George Hargraves hired George Hargraves to fix this god awful master plan, and then. Uh, enforced upon him against his will and against his advice the obligation to hire big name architects. Yeah, so he had to do that or had to allow for them to build. And of course, the first one to build on the campus got the project in 1989, the same year as that uh, wonderful ACSA thing, was uh, who? Peter Eisen. So Peter Eisen, who is George Hargrave's like bitter enemy. So over the years, it started to build, Peter built this building, and uh, what became interesting for me is over the last 20 years, about half of the buildings that were, were built new were built by wonderful professional architects like Harry Cobb and uh, uh, Guatme and Mo Udell, or it's the last name for Udell, is that right? And about half of them were done by weirdo architects, people like uh, Bernard Schumi, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, and uh, Tom May. Um, so this is Tom May, and this is, uh, you can hardly tell, I think it's kind of interesting, you can hardly tell, but as we look further and further into it, the question is, which of these produces a more salutary effect? Which of these produces a kind of attitude about contextualism, which is richer, closer to our sense of what we would like our lives to be? Because this is a period of time when the misbehaviors that went into these architectures essentially got digested by us. We, we became them, and we, you know, they're no longer un, not digestible oddities. They became very accessible forms of thinking about a context. So this is uh, Charlie Guatmay's, and this is uh, Harry Cobb's, this is Mario Dell's, and this is Tom May, who connects the landscape to the, uh, the football field. And this is a uh, French Enlightenment fantasy by Michael Graves. If you look at the campus, he just Here's the front door and main entry, and so he always likes to be the guy who designs the front door and main entry. So he just invents a front door and main entry right there. And then, and then uh, Tom comes in and finishes his courtyard. You know, so you see this a competition. It's not really a competition, but you see two approaches to the question of content. One which has a disciplinary interest, but a kind of calculated misbehavior, and the other one which is trying to do well by its clients do well by its clients by meeting their needs, understanding their needs, and in, more importantly, um, capitulating to their habits and expectations. So, I call this the, uh, okay, excuse me just a second. Uh, background turned black. Incredible that I can be still so confident after. <laughs> it's kind of cute, though, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> so, dental contextualism. Uh, 
a really important thing for you to learn. This is how you do it. <laughs> Remember that scene in uh, Young Frankenstein? It says, how I did it, Victor Frankenstein. This is it. So you use the established use type form. So if you're going to do a front tooth, you copy the front tooth, or you can do a library study, the building type of the library. You use adjacencies to determine, to determine the appropriate height. You use adjacencies to determine the appropriate color, and then you fill in the gaps. <laughs> that's a really great idea. And by the way, I wish most of you kids would learn it. <laughs> like if you go to dental school, you're there a year and a half. That's how long you're in to, to learn to do fillings and stuff. Right? You have a lot of education before you get in, but you're there basically 18 months. You guys are in school forever. And you can't even match a high fill in the gap. Now, why this is, has anybody ever had a tooth that was too high in their mouth? It sucks. You know, your mouth is in pain within days. And how many of you think you should have a white teeth? How many, like, when was the last time you got a fill in, John? Yeah, and did they match your, did they say, you know what, teeth are white. We'll put white in. Or did they pull that little chart over? And you know things are bad, like it goes A1, A2, A3. Those are the whites. So when you're looking at your teeth and they're saying C6. <laughs> anyway, I'm all for this. Uh, that's a, it's sort of a scientific idea about it. And by the way, that was it. It took us a long time to distill that. Um, and here's how it works. Now, it means you, you don't want to peter eyes in <laughs> you don't even want a Frank Gehry. You just want that. And that's a damn good thing to be able to do. So I, I'm all for that. Um, but most of the time, uh, or okay, let's say occasionally, there are opportunities in architecture where dental approaches to the field are going to be destitute, are going to miss the, the fact that we are human beings, that we change rapidly in certain ways, and we change slowly in certain ways, but we're constantly mobile and fluid, and our inner lives change as much as our uh, outer lives. My inner life has completely disappeared. I'm not sure where it was. Uh, I had one. So, now, there is a beautiful picture of dental contextualism. Don't you think? Just a, but you match the color, <laughs> use the right form, but it's pretty nice. I, you know, I didn't want to pick on any particular architect and make him a dental contextualist, but there are some little ones. Like, I think Harry Cobb's building in Los Angeles, the Union, the Union, Tower, the Union Bank building, is actually one of the most moving and intelligent pieces of, of dental contextualism. I mean, it's really incredible how well it works, and it, it works so well. What was that movie? You remember that movie? It was a movie about architecture criticism. I can't remember. People from another planet came. <laughs> And when they saw buildings they didn't like, they blew them up. <laughs> it's called uh, Independence Day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's impressive. It's fantastic. And the first building they blew up was that I just, uh, Harry is so proud of that. <laughs> and actually, I'm, Neil, do you recognize this building? The Shining. Yes, this is the Timberline Lodge by The Shining. Uh, and since you, <laughs> from the Shining. Since you did Gibri last night, I thought I would do my favorite. And uh, it's a great movie. I mean, yeah, so it has this thing. He drives up, you see this. Uh, the beautiful thing about the film, and becomes really important to how we think about it, is the only scenes of the Timberline Lodge that occur, actually, in the, are the out exterior scenes on the introduction, and one scene, which is the scene where Jack is tied that room where he types it. Everything else is either in the Connaught Hotel in London or on, on soundstage. Uh, when, you, when I used to lecture to architects, I would say, what's your favorite scene? they say, oh, I love the maze scene. And they love this scene because that's them. Like, they establish <laughs> order on the world. They look down on it. And you know, so they love this scene. And, and Kubrick knew that, which is why the next scene in this thing, is that, that's uh, Shelley Duvall and Danny. Do you remember that incredible scene? So, but there's something else going on in this movie I think it's worth paying attention to. Uh, so this is a Tim Ryan Lodge. What goes on is this. There are three characters. There's Danny, the little boy. I forgot Shelley Duvall's uh, name. Um, Wendy. 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 Wendy? Not Wendy. Yeah. Wendy's Peter Pan. Really? Wendy? Yeah. No wonder I forgot. I come from the home of Wendy's. Uh, everybody. 
everybody in the film has a right place in the, in the hotel. Like, he loves the public places. He stays in the public places. Shelley Duvall loves the domestic places, and she stays in them all the time. She goes to the kitchen, and she likes his apartment, but she doesn't come out. And Danny, uh, this was, they had a fight, so she gets happy to have And Danny likes the interstitial spaces. And, he, and we saw this, like, maybe it was with you actually spoke to some of this one thing. He likes uh, the hallways, the, any place that he shouldn't belong. Um, and so everything is fine as long as everybody stays in their place. But when somebody comes into the place that they don't belong, things go bad. So Shelley Duvall has, he's walked out. Shelley Duvall has walked in, windy. Uh, and then, you know, that's the all work, no play, makes Jack and Uh Danny won't come in from the hallway because if he comes in, he knows he's in trouble. Um, and he, it turns out he was in trouble. And as it goes on, <laughs> he doesn't belong in the domestic space of the bathroom. <laughs> and, and, you know, and Danny saves himself by going through the window. And then um, he's mad at Danny. And so he's going to hurt Danny with that axe. <laughs> but Danny recognizes this not as an ornament, but this is another spatial bridge. He already understands he can get in there and belong in there. And because Jack can't see that. He saves himself. And actually, if you remember the end of the movie, that's exactly how uh, they both go into the maze, and Jack keeps following the maze as if it's walls. Uh, but Danny crawls through, and that's how he saves himself. Now, for me, that means that there's a regi spatial regime which is more psychological, more narrative, <coughs> more culturally based, more bodily based. It's far more interesting, I think, than the kind of mental contextualism. And the question was, how did these issues creep into the problem of contextualism uh, in the ensuing years? So I decided to pick two giants, two people in the field that have achieved the status of, I believe, uh, giants, uh, and that their works are masterworks. Now, I'm using this, these terms for particular reasons. There's something that goes on in architecture. I've never put my finger on it. It refuses, it, it has a, what Nietzsche called resentment. It doesn't like any of its practitioners to be too well known or to do buildings that are too uh, honored. I don't know why. So it's constantly making fun of them or besmirching them. It's sort of like the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And so the two I picked were uh, Frank Gehry and uh, Ram Cool House. Um, I, I actually like giants. I like masterpieces. I don't know a field it doesn't understand itself in terms of its great achievements and also doesn't, under, doesn't also recognize that all those great achievements are built by all the other work that allows them to happen as moments of the field. But there's something in architecture that doesn't. So I decided to now this project, does anybody know when this project started? It's a recurring theme in this lecture, is it? 89. Who got that one? There you go. That's go to Penn. You can get the audience. <laughs> 89. So the same time as the ACSA uh, and this project, which is from when? <laughs> Thank you. 89. Uh, is that true? No. You don't know. Nobody's got the nerve to pull out their Google. And, but yes, they're all 89. So uh, the thing that happened this project has got delayed for eight years and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, and most of these buildings, most of these two projects are really <coughs> considered anti-contextual. I mean, the, the wrap on Disney Hall is it's beautifully sculptural, um, and it has great acoustics. Now, I point out to you that the great acoustics of Disney Hall uh, are not Frank's achievements. Um, so the minute you've started to talk, its sculpture is somehow its architectural effect. It has nothing to do with its real architectural effect. Uh, and great acoustics are its scientific effect. And this was the project which ultimately leads to the uh, bigness um, essay with its famous uh, evocation or invocation of Bud um, So I wanted to go back and look at those because they they continue to exercise incredible um, power on the field long after that. This one built, this was not built. Do you know who won this competition? Do you know who won the Trey Grand Bibli Tech National Competition? Yeah. And how is that? <laughs> uh, and do you know who the other persons were in this competition? 
Thoroughly, Poline, and uh, Eric, kind of Dominique, not Dominique, German Dominique, Act that's for Dominique, another guy. Three, three Pritzker, three Pritzker Prize winners at all time. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, three of them had won Pritzker Prize, Frank had won a Pritzker Prize, and Frank was told by the Disney family that under no circumstances would he ever design a building with their name. This is how he went into the competition. Won the competition. So anyway, so now we're going to trace this. So this is the uh, OMA uh, really thing right now. This is a really famous picture of the uh, solid point reversals. Um, I became, I'm, I'm sort of interested in this problem, so um, one thing I want you to notice is everything is basically on uh, parallel to the plate, except for one little point. You see that little thing that's together. The pattern lines This one tilts a little bit, but everything else is in the logic of the little plate. So this one tilts just a little bit. And everything else is lined up. He actually, he rarely went off axis. And it was a really important sort of neo modernist aspect. Now, remember, in 89, he had built all of the work he had built, which was directly quoting famous architects. He had quoted uh, Korb and Nice in virtually every project. The greatest, the, the big project before this, after the houses, was the Agadir Convention Center, which is a synthesis of Strasbourg and the uh, National Gallery. So he had spent his time copying and quoting giants. And uh, 1989 was the year of those the three projects, ZKM and uh, this one and the Zebra uh, Port. And it was the first time there was a kind of break away from direct quotation of the work. But he maintained his legacy to a certain sort of modernist organization, which had to do with not liking skewed angles. Uh, this was the project that also produced this little piece of paper, which is in, in his, if you read the uh, SMXL, L, whatever the letters are. I was very proud about that because I wear double X, uh, so it didn't comprehend me. <laughs> <laughs> I lost weight for a little while. I got down to XL, and I thought, this sucks. <laughs> uh, when he's describing this project, he's describing it, there's a little note in his diary that says, imagine a room with no, where the floor turns continuously to the wall, the wall turns continuously to the ceiling, and the ceiling and, and moves back around. It's kind of an anticipation of the single surface problem. Now, Bob said something in introducing Neil last night that I identified Neil's work with the single surface problem. Actually, at a certain point in time, particularly in a library that comes up, it was important to recognize the bifurcation in those two problems between continuous surface problems, which were topologically oriented, and single surface problems, which weren't. For example, Neil's projects are, are loath to use too much um, structure to support them. They like to be as self-structuring as possible. Is that true? Whereas, actually, Rem goes out of his way, and most of this, it, it's one of the requirements of single surface problems that it not be self-structuring. In fact, it's incredible that there's 150 important single surface projects, two or three buildings, not one word of theory about why that idea has so captured the imagination of architects that it happens all over the world. I have not yet read an essay yet that says, this is the effect that captures their imagination. But it was important to recognize there is a difference between single surface. And yeah, it's with this little board. Uh, now, so I'm turning my attention now, I went back to the SMS LX, uh, now sort of looking at the project and trying to see if I can understand what's the role of context in this. And so the first thing he does is shows a boule, you know, Library by Boulay, and he's, um, yeah, not, he's I guess Boulay was French. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's contextual, right? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> then the next thing you look at, you see this incredible picture, and what is that thing? Is that a Boulay library here? No, that's the subways. The subways of Paris. But I'm like, why is that picture about? Like, why is that there? So I'm looking at these pictures, and I'm looking at these pictures. <laughs> and I think, oh my God, this project is about the subways of, Pro of Paris. This project is essentially one of the dirty realist projects in which he argued against the cliches of a promenade in Paris down the boulevard to a library and said the realities of Paris are if you go down into a tube, 
You go to a stop, there's a thousand or ten thousand people on the stop. You then go up an elevator or staircase by yourself and you come in, you're in a hole. And so basically, what I think is incredible about this project, and he never actually says that, he never writes that down, he never says it. Uh, he told it to me, I swear to God, over breakfast in London, he denies it completely, which means it's my idea. <laughs> <laughs> Then again, another achievement. Uh, so that's a weird thing, right? Not only that, it, not only does it do this, it's got a big spotlight and shoot it. So I started to think about it. Then there's this weird picture of this librarian. You turn a page and there's, you know, there's this strange librarian. There's no book, you can't access it's the book. Going. It's a very odd picture. So we'll leave it for a moment. And then there's these plans that are completely, and these are completely inexplicable. Like, why would you draw? The superposition of the plans, since you, there is no such thing as a plan, why don't you draw on that superposition? But as I studied this project more and more, you see the, you see the slight tilt? But it basically means, I'm sorry, <clears throat> that to get that effect in the drawings, he has to tilt that object. So there's a place in the building where he's changing the building to support a drawing that no one will ever look at in this way. I don't know, you can't get more disciplinary into that. I mean, he changes the entire attitude about the building to maintain an effect in the drawing. It was probably accidentally discovered. Um, so he then, so he has a great period then. Uh, so for me, that's a deeply contextual idea. You know, that basically, the realities of Paris are the realities of <coughs> being in tubes and landing in holes and then going back in tubes and landing on the place that did that. Now, if you think, this and that building exercise, fantastic uh, power on the field, if you think actually about what the experience of being in this building was, it would have been horrible. Yeah, it would have been just like being in the subway, which is horrible. Yeah, and so, but so what? So then he has this really bad period. Uh, really, so that's 89. He, he, loses a couple of, all those projects, he wins ZKM, comes in second here, uh, comes in second in Zebruga, all of them get canceled, he has no work. He does, he's desperate, so he does a soccer stadium gymnasium competition in Sayatama, uh, Japan. Now, I knew that, I was, I was a neighbor of his, so I would see this work developing, and I remember that Bob and I did a, a lecture in, uh, London, and I, I was trying to show the worst projects by Peter Eisman, the worst projects by Greg Gulhaus. I dug this thing back up. I showed it. I think this is as funny as the worst project. Uh, it was never on his website. It's not in any publication. It's not in small, medium, large, and large. Two weeks after I give the lecture, it's on the front page of his website. <laughs> so, and I think it's a quite a wonderful project. For, uh, you know, it, it's a moment where he's decided that he needs to jettison all of his discipline not just the quotational aspects of the work, and basically go back to who his most important mentor was, which was uh, Cedric Price. And this is, you know, the relationship to the Fun Palace, I think is pretty straightforward. But, you know, it's a bizarre, look, look, look carefully at what this is. These are buildings floating in the air on a, a gridded structure, or a truss structure, with gigantic counterweight and pulleys so that he can raise and lower the building so there's in an earthquake zone. Like that was a super good idea, don't you think? You're in a, you're on a, you got gigantic weights and ropes pulling it up. What he wants to do is raise and lower the buildings to form different configurations um, in support of the idea that uh, Cedric had introduced, which was loose fit plan. So he gave, multi, he gave increased, wrote more robust event structure to the building without any disciplinary characters whatsoever. Uh, like all really bad projects, and actually if your teachers don't show you bad projects by architects, and only do you good projects, they're not doing good service, really great things still come out of them. And this is the first time in any of Graham's work you'll ever see small, medium, large, and extra large here. And then a year later he starts on the book. I think this is a this is the project we all this is the project where I think of as the single surface becoming separate from the continuous uh, surface problem. It's an extremely interesting problem project. Uh, it won the competition. 
the library is hated. Why is the library is hated? There's no place for books. Uh, it's actually, you know, kind of hard. It leaks, has no walls. <laughs> no, but it's an, an, another, I think, maybe the most important project on Bill Project by OMA. Uh, and then when you read there, you see the visitor becomes a Baudelarian plan over. And basically what he does is he takes the Maison Domino diagram, and you can tell that by looking at the staircases, which has um, a kind of uh, centrifugal diagram of politics and optics. You're standing in the Maison Domino and you look out. You look out through the ribbon window. And uh, so everything inside is about uh, extending the space of the building outwards and looking out from the building. And so each person is equal in this looking out. In this building, uh, borrowing from the Guggenheim in New York diagram, you actually are a voyeur in other people. You know? So you're actually in the library not to study, not to read, but to become a fly in the Essentially, a person who strolls down the street and observes with pleasure, casually, and uh, you know, the, the behavior of other people. It's an, it's, so this idea of a kind of contextualism which is now psychological, and also the power of architecture to do two things. It can support your, an institutional character. Like if you're doing work in architecture, you, uh, there's an expectation on the part of an institution, like at the Whitney Museum, when the Royer has you cross a moat so that you leave the noise of the city behind, you cross a moat, you get in a reflective mood. So the museum is a machine to put you in character. Now that, that introduces a new kind of misbehavior for architecture. I wonder if you can successfully put the people in the wrong character for the institution, or in a different character for the institution, which, by the way, is what the accomplishment of Seattle Library is. So I, I take all of these as, as deeper forms of contextualism, and it explains this picture. Does anybody know how it explains this picture? Signature. Mm -hmm. Who said that? You said that? I don't want two people going to Penn, and nobody's going to go to Yale, so we don't have to do that. <laughs> it's too hard to get there. So it's a Cindy Sherman. It's not a library. It's one of the Hollywood film stills by Cindy Sherman. Cindy Sherman is an artist whose work is all about the plasticity of character. She puts herself in every one of her photographs, and she photographs herself in every possible kind of character. And her work is about that. Her work is about the incredible freedom and, that comes from an elasticity of character. And so it's, 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 so, it's so beautifully and silently placed in the, in the book that you don't really notice it. And if you don't notice it in Sherman, you know, the funny thing about the, the picture is that there are no libraries taking, if you know the library, it's completely automated, there's no libraries taking, libraries taking stuff off the shelf. It's counter to the idea, but it's perfect for the idea that Brown's thinking about the institution. And so that's the history of the, the contextualism, I think, from Brown. I'm going to do this real quick, and then I'll think. Okay. This is the Disney Hall. Disney Hall. You know, great piece of sculpture, enthusiasm. I'll, I don't know what, I, I'd be interested in what you think about it. Um, 89, <coughs> in 19, what was the year? What's the year this was, I think? 77. 77? Yeah, so in it, you know, Frank studied urbanism um, did, at Harvard, didn't study architecture. He wanted to be an architecture, but he didn't like architects. And so when he builds this house, it genuinely is driven by the art. There's, I don't think it's. Any, I think it's a fantastic thing. I think it's incredibly fun to study and to teach. But it's really not a disciplinary project. It is really belongs to that sort of uh, canon breaking period. But if you follow his work after that, he becomes absolutely dedicated to the idea of mastering a certain disciplinary in his work. And so he begins. It's so clear at this point that he's studying uh, Aldo Rossi and. He's, he's sort of interested in contextual memories from that point of view. I mean, he, this is a, almost a, an exact copy of the map. This is the Witten House. Uh, it looks like San, San Gimignani, which is the Tuscan village that Aldo Rossi claims that all of his memories are derived from. And, and you know, so he's, working, he's doing these sorts of experiments and he's trying to figure out how do you respond to a context without imitate, without doing dental contextual. So he's thinking about memory and psychology, and he's working through these practices. His, the work develops, this is 94, I think. This is the Fred and Ginger. This is an incredibly contextual project. Uh, it, has the, it, it restores an onion dome to the corner, which is the standard of the urbanism in Prague and Vienna and that part of Europe. 
Uh, so you had to show a round corner and you had to mark the availability corner. It was round so you felt safe when you turned it and you, you put the, am I correct on this? I mean, I read this in some book. Um, I think. Uh, you know, if you look at the penetration <coughs> building on the left, and if you look at the penetration of the building on the right, they're completely incommensurate. And so what he tried over there, so what the, the entire thing is to work out in a very, I think, naive way, uh, a way of joining these into a kind of new sense of context that isn't about doing dental education. It's a beautiful project. It's affecting his language. And then he begins to do the work that we know today. So the first one to go about. This is maybe, I think, better the two, although I think the project in Cleveland is maybe the best. Now, uh, it is sculptural. It is beautiful to see. It's fantastic. Um, but what kind of work does it do architecturally? Because to be sculpturally interesting is the cheapest and easiest of architectural things. And a long time before the Bill Bow effect, there was something called the Leaning Tower of Pisa effect, uh, which essentially the entire economy of Pisa has been based on that building. So I'm not quite sure why Frank gets the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's beautiful about this building is that all these curves are derived from this. All the curvatures are derived from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion across the street. And it's so much so that when you stand under the under the one of the things and you look up, it matches perfectly. So he, he's looking around, but more importantly, he's negotiating the high rises in the background. So he's, he's trying to put something in which will be more robust in its capacities to incorporate all the diversities of the building context instead of picking one and matching it. So in order to get the high rises to be connected to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. This is the language that he discovers that can do it. And it's really quite beautiful. And he uses a typical uh, diagonal entry on the Los Angeles grid. But he does it for, it's kind of funny. Uh, can I ever get this thing to work before? So, oh yeah, so here's a big, this is called a promenade in Los Angeles, is that right? People from Los Angeles? And it was supposed to be an important public Space. It's basically a band. Am I correct about that? And the idea was, was that when he put this on axis, he was trying to basically force the city to get rid of this building. So everything about this project is not only more interestingly contextual than what it would be, do, would, would be to do dental contextualism, but also is putting pressure on the city to continue to grow in a way that he thought was would improve the context. Now, it's a very interesting building. When you walk in, there's this incredible warren, like you don't know how to get to your seat. And it's very difficult to get to your seat. You know, there's stairways here, and it's not, you know, it's confusing. But by the time you get to the seat, you're in this space, which, by the way, was universally condemned by all the critics as ridiculously conservative in its symmetries. Like, why would Frank Gehry possibly do a, a auditorium of that of that character in a building of this character. Yeah. Here are some possible answers. Uh, he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know Frank, you will dwell on that a little bit. You'll just, you'll just think of that. Now. Or else he had something else in mind. It may work, it may not work, it's not clear, but he had something else in mind. And so I, I, I think we'll try to discover that now. Let you get it. I might do a time like that. Okay. I'll finish it. That thing in the middle is also that organ is. Like, it's bad enough that it's, at, it's symmetrical, but to exaggerate it that way is, is it's, and he, but that's, that's his crowning achievement. When you ask him, he says, my crowning achievement is the organ and the light from the city coming in. So that's natural light, so when you, I'll show a picture. That's basically the natural light, daylight from the city coming in, which is weird because you always see concerts at night, you never get uh, now, this is the picture I want to show. This is a picture that compares Frank's entry to his um, concert hall to Sharoon's entry to his concert hall. Um, Sharoon had to build the Philharmonic. It's the first building built in Berlin after the war. Right. The only thing that's even more dramatic than that, the greatest building built in modernity, I believe, is the National Gallery by Nice. And I don't even particularly like Nice, but that's the greatest of all the buildings. And why it's even more interesting than Sharoon is it not only went up in the memory 
of the war and in the memory of the Holocaust and in the still while Berlin is, is uh, in ruins, but also at six months after the Berlin Wall gets built. And he has to build a museum to find a role for art in that context. But we're not doing that. Sarun has to build a Philharmonic. Now that's kind of an interesting idea. It's a, it's a particularly interesting idea given the fact that Nazi Germany used two devices to essentially cause the kind of fascist uh, passion uh, as, as tricks, as uh, what do you call them? Uh, not paraphernalia. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Thanks for helping me, guys. Uh, propaganda tricks. One was architecture, as you know, and the other one was music. And so he's faced with the problem of doing a concert hall as the first public building in Berlin right after that. And you know, Sharoon got the job as a city planner because he had his early work was German Expressionist work and was basically studying the trees and the, everything. But the, you know, the German Expressionist architects were against historicism and so they wanted a deeper truth in their work, which is you know, matching the soil or making the stuff look like mountains. Plus, he was in uh, correspondence with Hannah Arendt, a great uh, political philosopher. So he builds this concert hall, and the materials are about matching the soil, I mean, the clay of Berlin. The clay of Berlin is roughly like uh, red clay in Georgia. And the form is trying to match the uh, natural landscape. So he's doing his best to find something that belongs to the context, but no longer belongs to the built context. And more importantly, like, oh, by the way, Bob Sommel is the only person I know who wrote anything good about Helmut Young. You know? And no one remembers that, but I'm reminding you. And this is, I think, maybe the most dispiriting vampire, zombie, horrible thing to ever hit Earth. It's the Sony Center, right? It's just really terrible. Now, it's kind of nice, it's my dad probably right now. But, and I blame Bob. <laughs> uh, if I'm correct, if any of you know that, uh, really the details of the history of Nazi Germany? Good, exactly. So I want to tell you what I know to be absolutely true. Um, I'm told, well, and we're open. <laughs> Ended early. Sorry. Let's see, I'm at, I've got 300 more slides to get over here. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, hang on, that's not that hard. Here I am working for Asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> I feed your dog on <laughs> I'm led to believe by experts that. When the Nazis assembled to do the march on Poland, they assembled in the tear garden, and they followed this act. And so the first thing Sharoon did was to break that relationship. No gathering place for troops, and no capacity to march on major acts. And so he changes the roadway, and puts the Philharmonic in the library right there in the space. So it's a gesture very similar, I think, to Frank Gehry's idea about the park. Uh, I won't belabor this because I think you know it pretty well, but um, the thing that's so fascinating about this is this auditorium. Because he now has to stop uh, people who just come through the passions of fascism from regathering as fascists. And so he takes a four story auditorium and breaks it up into 18 plates. And so nobody, there is no coherent, you, you, there is nothing but small or small organic groups that are unable to form into a collective. It's so complicated that there's twice as many ushers, and you can't actually find your seat. You really can't. There's four staircases, and you can't cross from one to another, and somebody actually has to tell you how to get to your seat. It's impossible to just find it. <coughs> there's an attitude about it like the city. Whenever a window would show you the city, he puts colored glass in or stained glass. Whenever it's, uh, whenever it's not, he puts in clear glass. So he uses the light of the city, exactly the same thing that the uh, Frank does. And then he produces this fantastic. He uses a thing called con convex symmetries. He needs the symmetries for the acoustic. Now look, look at the concert hall. So here's the convex symmetry. There's the uh, way off to the back, nowhere, is the organ. You can barely see it. And so 
everything about this project is about working out a political relationship uh, between architecture and context through the, the institutional program. It, the acoustics are terrible, famously bad. Um, and then you got this problem, like, what's, like why this? Why start off with Sharoon? Why imitate so many of the ideas? Why, why advance, use his advanced contextual language? The, con the contextual language is simple. It's about gathering the most disparate forces in all of uh, in Los Angeles' uh, existing urban architecture momentarily into a kind of provisionally coherent Dorothy Chandler connected to them. But he gets in here. Now, let me ask you, I'm, I'm curious about this. Uh, does anybody know the, the country in the world who chose a fascia, a symbol of fascism, as its symbol? The first country in the world, actually, after Rome, choose it as a national symbol. Anybody? Except for those who have our class, which is all of you. The answer is really simple. It's the United States. Look on the back of your dime. So e pluribus unum is a declaration of the fascist idea, and plus they put the Roman fascia on the, the symbol on the back of the dime. Look at it, it's still on your dime today. They were forced to make it small, so the Mercury dime went to the, to the uh, Roosevelt dime, but Congress would refuse to put, even this was during the war, the period of the war, but Congress refused to get rid of it. And that's what that is. Now that is a provisionally accumulating fascia in the middle of a space designed to exaggerate the coherence of an audience in a city that has 30 separate languages, the most unlisted phones, and in the most atomized, this uh, despairingly non-unified city in the world of its size. And I, I think whether you think it works or not, and obviously it's not true that the Koreans and the uh, African Americans and the Vietnamese and the Somalis and the Latinos of, of various uh, ethnic backgrounds are all going to come to these concerts. You know, who's going to come to these concerts are old, rich, white people, mostly Jews, and young people who want to play classical music for old, rich, white people, mostly Jews. <laughs> Having been there, I know this. Uh, so it's not really about its effect on the audience. It's about its effect on the audience of architecture, I think. But I think it's a profound project. I mean, I think it's a profoundly contextual project. And so I... I urge you to consider disciplinarity as opposed to professionalism and to also understand what it means to misbehave. Now, misbehavior is really an interesting problem. You cannot, you cannot do what we try to do for so long. You cannot incorporate misbehavior. You cannot have your students in the studio. You cannot encourage them to resist you. You cannot encourage them to find themselves. These are, these are like the worst ideas. You come in, I want you to come to my class, I'm going to teach you how to add, but I don't want you to do, don't no add right. Be yourself. And so that was an incredibly interesting period. So we need a kind of new formula for how to teach disciplinarity. And I have it, but I think I'm going too long, so I have my I'm sorry if you love this project, because the clear glass represents the river. This, is the pro this project has the effects that I think are the most despicable in all of architecture, and that is you get it. You get it right away, you get it quickly, and boy, you just get it, and get it, and get it, and get it. <laughs> so he goes around and he finds some local barns and boathouses, he puts them on top of a river, and now it's a museum. I mean, it's just like, really. <laughs> This is a nice project. This is Stan. I'm, I'm all belabored this. But he was interested in a similar problem. And he's interested in the problem of how to be contextual. Now, the thing that was interesting about Neil's talk last night is every project was discussed in those terms, but no longer was it discussed in the terms of how to do it. It was, we, it's a finished problem. And I think that's extremely interesting. It took us about 20 years. We have lots of techniques. There are wonderful new innovations. But the innovations belong to the problem set. I think, for example, Jason's Raspberry Field is a really brilliant innovation 
and using the stochastic process of materiality to, to do the contextual. But that, that has to do, a certain sense, with paying attention to the local conditions and matching the materials and stuff. So, you know, this kind of attitude would have been was something that clearly uh, Sam was thinking about. But there's a level of abstraction in the work. And I start, when I started looking at the work, the first thing it reminded me was of Michael Meredith's uh, Ordos project. Now, when I saw Michael Meredith's Ordos project, the first thing it reminded me was the Cubby Playhouse that you can buy, that, you, that I actually bought uh, about four or five years ago. <laughs> so, um, it is good to you know, shop on the web and stuff. Like you see this little It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm sure that's the appropriate image. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I said something about kids, you might have heard that. You know, that Mike, uh, Michael and Meredith and Hillary Moss and uh, Hillary Sample, and I know her name, of Moss, they did these incredible projects. And, and they have the kind of uh, adventurous misbehavior within the discipline that I'm most interested in. And what I particularly am interested in is this fantastic. Uh, I don't know what the word would be, but uh, I'm going to skip all this stuff. But you see, what is, when you look at this project by Stan, what's really interesting is that the roofscape has a level of geometric abstraction unlike any of the quotational ways we would approach the problem. And it, I think it came directly from an interesting, undigestible moment in the field right now. Two young groups of young teens. They're essentially trying to stay, work through disciplinary problems, but also make an undigestible architecture, an architecture that's not consumable by professional practices, not even easy to understand or teach. One is, uh, this is the, uh, I think it's called sand. This is the moss sand. It's basically a pile of cubes. Uh, and then sometimes they pile them around spheres. And, you know, so they wrote a script. They're, they, they write scripts. They write these things. You know, they pile around a thing, and that's it. That's the product. So this is like the house. Here's another. Why well, have the library? That's a house. That's a library. <laughs> Green library. Very important. <laughs> the other guys that I think are doing really interesting work, I think, uh, are a random language. They, they have a kind of faux scientificity in their scripting, but everything is driven by um, really interesting knowledge of their discipline, like the grotto problem, when they did the grotto competition for PS1. Wonderful company, ugly as sin, completely antithetical to the idea of architecture as service practice, um, but you know, sort of brilliantly ironic and funny experiment on geometry. And actually, I think what was, the, for me, the interesting thing about Stan is the degree to which he appropriates as a kind of early adapter, early adopter. <coughs> This work. Now, I know for a fact that the way he became aware of these two projects, which he wasn't before, is when John McBurrow invited him to Princeton for a young practitioner's competition, and Stan was sitting in the audience, and he saw these two projects. He mm -hmm. saw the Moss Sand, and he saw the, uh, the Grotto project. And, you know, he does what you should do as a disciplinarian. He knew the, the, the stuff of uh, Gary, and he knew all the stuff of Valor Rossi. He wanted to match the local context, the roofscape is super important. That was his idea of being contextual. But all of a sudden, from these younger practices, the, he's learning a kind of architectural abstraction that we never had in our power before. So this geometric, I think that's the best image of it, where these don't look like anything. These don't look like the roofs. But in relationship to the way he organizes the building and how they sit on the plates, or the structural plates, they become that without being that. And I think it's a really wonderful moment of the way I think disciplinary should work. So just to close, here's the formula. I know you want to see the formula. Oh, but <laughs> you got to change them all to white again. <laughs> then, then you get the guy. I think I'm screwing up our, my dinner reservation. I'll be really pissed if I don't want to get asked for another to eat. <laughs> here's the step one. Teachers, stand on this. Look at step two. <laughs> that one is just, isn't it terrible to give away the punchline? I mean, it's only an idiot that doesn't know how to lecture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. 
Give me 20 more minutes, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> Step one is... Uh, How is the text? Okay. Now just highlight all of them. <laughs> Sit control A. You guys must get paid in cash. <laughs> <laughs> Step one is simple. Acknowledge the existence of giants. Not only that, invent some. You know, recuperate old. I thought uh, Peter Zellman's recuperation of uh, the guy from Yale. Um, <laughs> Rudolph. Rudolph, yeah. Uh, Brilliant and beautiful. And the only thing that made me disappointed about it is he didn't end on his own work because he's recuperating Rudolph as, as a disciplinary gesture to support his own work. So make that people, you know, but have giants and embrace that idea. And the second one is get rid of the David and Goliath model, which is what, you know, when you walk in and you teach everybody to kill their elders and kill you, the teacher, and disobey. Like disobey and disobedience are, I mean, and misbehavior are not the same thing. So get rid of that idea. The problem with that idea is that occasionally it's verified in the field by genius. But you can't <coughs> teach it. So get rid of the David Goliath model. The third one is get your students to stand on the shoulders of giants. So not only have giants, but stand on their shoulders. That's how they're going to do interesting things. <coughs> and then the last two are have them wear cleats. <laughs> And then jump up and down while they're standing on the <laughs> Eventually, the giants will succumb, and that's my formula for teaching this student. So, thank you very much. Thanks, it was a really great conference today, and I'm congratulating you.